Hi, I'm Alistair, I'm a games designer, and in this video I'd like to teach you how you can create this electronic sequence puzzle. So in this puzzle players are given a numeric prompt and they need to work out which one of these coloured buttons to press in response. Now before I get any further I need to make a slight apology because normally I try to make my games as accessible as possible. But this particular puzzle is not going to work for colourblind players. Now normally if you have a puzzle that has some coloured inputs you could also add some other means of differentiating between them. So I could put a different symbol or a pattern on these buttons or something like that. But in this case every time the players press one of these buttons you'll see that the colours actually change. And players need to work out which button to press based on a series of rules that they're given. So if I just reset the uh, controller back to the beginning state here. So I've been given the number three and I'll just show you a bit closer actually. So um, using the number three that might be as simple as saying well we need to press the third button along so that's the blue one here. I'll press that and you'll see that was correct. We've moved on to the next stage up here, this bar has filled up and now I've been given the number one. Well that might mean press the yellow button for example. So I press the yellow button that's now in the fourth position. We've got the number one again so I press the yellow button again but now it's here in the third position. And now we've got the number four. So four might mean for example in the rules um, press the button in the same position as you pressed last turn. So I pressed yellow when it was there, then I pressed yellow when it was there, now I'm going to press this button again which is now green. And you'll see that this sequence can carry on, you can make these rules as complicated or as simple as you want. I'll show you how to edit that in the code later on. For as long as the player gets the sequence correct this bar fills up and when it uh, reaches the top end here we could for example activate a relay that releases a maglock or um, displays a code to the player, something like that. Uh, if the players get the sequence incorrect at any point what happens is we reset back to the beginning and we're given a new prompt. Now uh, this is randomised each time the game begins so they'll actually have to follow the sequence from the beginning over again. Now I think this could make a great um, escape room puzzle. It involves uh, following just a sequence of commands and if you separate the rules that players need to follow from the input here you can make it into a multiplayer sort of cooperative game as well and also an element of communication between players. So it's kind of a fun team puzzle to solve. Okay so let me show you some of the hardware and what's going on here. If we take a look at the back of the board you'll see that I've got an Arduino Nano which is what's powering the uh, whole puzzle. And I've got my row of four arcade buttons here and then I've got a little protoboard here that's powering the seven segment display and the stage display. But uh, let's start off by taking a look at the buttons in more detail. So these are illuminated arcade buttons just like this one here. You can see there's a mechanical switch that activates here and if I just pull this apart I can remove the two components. This half here, this is purely plastic mechanical so we don't need that. And here we've got uh, the switch itself and at the top Normally it would be illuminated by a simple white LED. You can see it's got uh, two legs there. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to replace that LED with a PL9823 programmable LED instead. So you can see this has got uh, four legs and it works in much the same way as a NeoPixel or a WS2812B LED strip except it comes in the form factor of a regular LED. And what we're going to do is we're going to insert that into the plastic housing here uh, where the white LED was. So I'm just going to snap that off from the switch itself. And you can see it's got contacts here which were what uh, was the anode and cathode of the white LED. I'm going to just pull those out uh, with a pair of pliers here. You don't need to apply too much force here, just a bit of a wiggle hopefully. There we go. So now I've just got the plastic housing left. And what I'm now going to do is go back and grab my programmable LED here. 
I'm just going to feed the wires that go to it uh, through the plastic housing. So I've got uh, a ground wire, uh, I've got a data in line, a 5 volt line and also a data out line because what I'm going to do is connect um, the four LEDs to go to the four buttons, I'm going to connect them in series to each other. So very much like um, a NeoPixel strip, it's just that they're going to be separate LEDs. I'm just going to pull those through like that and just wiggle the LED down to the housing. So that's now sitting in the housing there and I've got my four uh, wires coming out of it. So now what I'm going to do is just going to try and pull them to the side so that I can put the uh, switch back on again. I don't want the wires to get in the way of the uh, button operation itself. So use relatively thin wires helps at this point here. Um, but just test that that still works. Yeah, that's fine, that's okay. And then what we can do is just straighten those wires up a bit. Um, and we can now insert the casing of the button back on the top again. And we've got a fully RGB uh, button that we can change the colors of, illuminated. There we go. Um, and just to show you that that is indeed what I've got running here. So here is my uh, yellow LED and then I've got a blue one here. And if I pull them out, so this uh, the slight sort of rat's nest of wires at the bottom is um, the data connections that are going between them in series. They kind of look a bit like a, a set of Christmas lights now. So if I press one of the buttons and I can make the lights rotate through the different colour sequences. Uh, okay, that's the buttons. Now let's take a look at the other half of the board. So where we've got our, um, our bar graph display that shows what stage we're on at the top here. And then underneath that we've also got a seven segment LED that is the prompt that lets players uh, know what input they have to do in this round. So to show you those I'm just going to um, unscrew the uh, little standoffs that I put on this half of the board here. So you'll see the, the Nano I'm using, I mounted it on a little um, kind of shield, it's a sensor shield that just, uh, they're really useful actually for prototyping and also for sort of um, just wiring sensors into uh, a Nano conveniently because they expose um, all the pins as convenient little uh, access pins. But I've just wired it to this proto shield at the bottom. Let me just unscrew these. You can see what's going on here. And then I'll slide that off. Okay, so you can see uh, we've got a little bit of electronics going on here. We've got this chip at the top here. This is a MAX7219 chip. And it is connected via five wires to the nano over here. So we've got a five volt line, a ground line, a clock, a slave select, and a data in line. And that's because we're using an SPI interface to the chip. Um, so this is a, the Max 729 is a LED driver chip. And in fact, I've used it in previous projects, and you might have seen it used in components such as this. So it can drive uh, a set of um, seven segment displays like this. The MAX7219 can actually drive 64 LEDs. If I can just persuade my camera to get this in focus. If I put my hand behind it, will that help? There we go. So here we see the MAX7219 chip. And in this case, it is driving 64 LEDs because we have got eight seven segment displays and each one also has a decimal point at the bottom. So that's 64. This is another LED matrix. This time it's arranged in a, a square format. And if I just pop that off the front there, you'll see once again inside we've got a MAX7219 chip. Slightly different form factor, but it's exactly the same. And when I pop this back on the top, this time it's arranged as eight columns and eight rows of LEDs. So again, 64 LEDs. So what I've effectively done here is I've, I've made a custom controller. I've got uh, a bar graph that's got 10 LEDs in a row here, and then I've got a seven segment display and a dot. So I'm controlling a total of 18 LEDs from the MAX7219 chip here. So it's like a, a custom LED controller effectively. And I'll show you the code that I'm using that lets me set any number I want on the seven segment display there, and also to change the value on the bar graph as well for the progress. So I can set them independently. 
Um, and uh, it's all controlled by the Nano here, and that's about it. And here's how all those components are wired together. Now, this diagram is quite busy and it might look a bit scary. Um, one of the reasons for that is because I've pasted in additional uh, diagrams of the components I'm using around the outside just to provide some more information. But when you kind of break it down, it's actually not that bad. So that's what we'll do. And we'll start off by looking at the uh, simplest part, probably, which is these button inputs here. So I've got four arcade buttons, all of which have got two contacts. And one of those contacts goes to the ground pin on the Arduino. And then the other contact here, I've got going to digital pins four, five, six, and seven. Um, now I'm using the internal pull-ups on the Arduino for those lines. So there's no other components required for those at all. Now, each of those buttons has inserted into it a PL9823, as I showed you, and those have got four legs. So the sort of complicated bit here, I suppose, is to determine which leg is which. And there's two ways you can do that. Um, on one side of the LED, there's actually a, a kind of a flat side here, and there's a beveled side on here as well. So uh, you can rotate the LED around and look for which edge is the flat side. That's one way to do it. Um, the other way to do it is that one of the legs is actually slightly longer than the other ones. So uh, you can use either of those two methods to identify it. And then if you take a look at the side of the LED so that you've got the flat side on the left and the longest leg is uh, leg number two here. Well, if you do that, then the pins in order are data out here. Then you've got ground, that's the longest uh, leg. Then you've got VCC, which is five volts. And then you've got uh, data in on this leg here. So what you can see here is I'm taking a wire out from digital pin eight on the Arduino. That's going into the data in of the first LED. And then I've also got uh, five volts and ground. And then the data out leg of the first LED is going to the data in leg of the next one in series, which has also got five volts and ground. And then we take the data out from that to the data in and the data out to the data in. And then the LED at the end of the strip, well, that doesn't need to have its data out uh, leg connected because it's got nowhere else to go. So what we formed is we formed a series of four LEDs in a row. Like I say, this behaves very, very similarly to a, a NeoPixel or a WS2812 strip of LEDs in a row. Um, and in fact, we'll be using the fast LED library to control them as well. That's the library I normally use for NeoPixels. Uh, one difference with these is that um, normally, if these are NeoPixels, you'd need to have a series resistor in a line before the first data pin, uh, but you don't need to do that with PL9823s. So other than the fact there's a little bit of uh, soldering involved in connecting them, in other ways they're actually a little bit simpler to use. Okay, so uh, that's the button and the input side. Now let's take a look at the other side of the circuit. So. Now this does look like a scary mess, but um, it's okay. So first of all, what we've got is the connections that go from the Arduino to the Max7219 chip. And this is the driver chip that's going to control the LEDs for the uh, numeric prompt and also for this stage display here. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we use an SPI interface um, to the chip. And in fact, we don't even need to connect all of the wires. We only need a four wire SPI interface um, because we're not going to send any data back from the chip to the Arduino. The data is only be going to go in this direction. So we have um, pin 11. That is the normal master out slave in pin on an Arduino. Uh, so that goes here into pin one. That's going to carry the data. Uh, we've got pin 10, that's normally the slave select line on an SPI interface in the Arduino. That goes into this pin at the bottom here, which is labelled load. Then we have a clock pin, uh, that's on pin 13, and that goes into the other pin at the base of the chip here. So those are the wires that are going to carry the data. We're going to have the, the chip select, 
we've got the clock signal and we've actually got the data in itself and then we also supply 5 volts uh, to the VCC pin here and there are two ground pins on this side of the chip here they both need to be connected to Arduino ground so um, this diagram up here this is actually a diagram from the data sheet which you can access on this link here and this just uh, labels those pins for you again so you identify which is the top of the, um, the chip by looking at this little cutout here and the little dot you see that those are located here so I flip that around uh, so we're using the data in the load the clock the uh, V plus and the two ground connections now I've also got um, two capacitors on the line that's going to the VCC connection here. That's uh, something that's actually recommended in the, uh, the data sheet here. And you can see I've actually put the value of the two capacitors across the, the line there. That's going to help smooth out um, any ripples that there might be in the voltage supply. And I've also got a resistor going into this pin here. So uh, this is labeled as the ISET pin and the I in this case means current so this is how you're going to determine the current that the chip is going to supply to each of the LEDs as you're probably aware normally when you if you were to just wire a simple LED to an Arduino GPIO pin you'd have to place a series resistor um, to limit the current supply to the LED otherwise uh, what happens is you'll you'll blow the LED you'll supply uh, too much current it will just draw as much current as it can and it will blow the LED. Now in this case notice that we haven't got any inline resistors here between the chip and the LEDs themselves but what we have instead is we have a single resistor coming into this I set pin and that's going to set the uh, the maximum current that the chip is going to supply. So it's kind of you can imagine it a little bit like a kind of a, a master or a shared resistor that we place here and that is going to set the value of the current supplied on the other side the output pins um, now there is a uh, table which you can find in the data sheet here of the different resistor values you can place here and the effect that they have on the current that it supplies I'm using a, a 42 kilo ohm resistor and I've just placed that attached to the um, to the I set pin here and then going to 5 volts again to the Arduino that's a fairly conservative um, value I've set there I could probably have taken that down to something closer to 30 kilo ohms to be honest and that would have made my LEDs brighter um, but you can you can test out different values um, uh, depending on the depending on the style of LEDs that you're using here um, so particularly different coloured LEDs typically draw uh, different amounts of current, different styles of LEDs as well. So if you've got a if you've got the data sheet for LEDs you can work out the exact value that you should be using here. Um, if not, like I say, you can use a value of around 40 kilo ohms. That's on the conservative side so um, it will be fairly safe for your LEDs to use that kind of value. Um, so that's kind of the connections between the Arduino and the LED driver chip. Then what we need to look at is the connections that go from the driver to the LEDs themselves. So you can imagine this is the, the output side of the, the MAX7219. And again, if we refer to the, uh, the diagram up here, what we can see that is on this side of the chip here, we've got a lot of pins that are labeled DIG or digit. So we've got digits 04623751. I don't quite know why they come in that order, but there you go. Um, so we've got up to eight digits, and on this side we've got uh, the segments. We've got segment D, DP, EC, GB, FA, and those correspond to the segments on a seven segment display here. So um, you, you essentially get two different styles of seven segment display. You can get ones that are called common anode and you can get ones that are called common cathode. And I'm using a common cathode and that is what I would definitely encourage you to do uh, if you're using this setup as well. That 
it is just about possible to to make a, a common anode work with a 7209 but you'll have to do quite a lot of additional work to make it uh, happen and it's not recommended at all so with a common cathode display which is what I'm using here what happens is that you've got these seven LEDs here and the cathodes of all of them are joined together and exit via uh, pins in the middle of the top and the bottom. So that's the the negative side of the LEDs if you want to think of it like that. That's the, the cathode. And then they all have individual anodes. So we've got the A, B, C, D, E, F, G and the decimal point here. So when you apply a positive voltage onto any one of these lettered anodes and then you have ground connected to the com here that section of the LED will light up and by lighting up combinations of these lettered segments so if we light up for example the A the B and the C well that's how we make the number 7 so we're going to use the driver chip here to display different combinations of um, supplying positive voltage to these anodes and then connecting the common cathode to ground to display different numbers. So um, we've got those relative pins here. We've got A, B, C, D, E, F and G. I've actually not connected the decimal point because um, I'm not going to use it in this example, but you can if you want. And those are wired to the segment um, pins on the MAX7219 chip here and then I've got the common cathode on this side and that is connected to uh, digit 0 so this is going to be my my first digit that we're going to use and uh, normally like I said when you use a MAX7219 to drive let's say a four digit seven segment display what you would then have is you'd have your other three digits here wired exactly the same way with the anodes except that the common cathode on this side would simply go to digits 1, 2 and 3 instead. But in this case we're doing something slightly different because we haven't got another 7 segment display here. What we've got is a bar graph LED that's got 10 segments. So um, we can't actually control this as a, another digit as such because it's got more segments in it than this does. So we're actually using two um, of the digit lines here. We've got this one here which is going to digit one and this is connected between all of the cathode side of the first eight LEDs here. So we're treating these first eight LEDs here in much the same way as one of these seven segment displays with a decimal point as well. And then the final two sections of the bar graph, so this is the, the ninth and the tenth segment, well those are going to digit two. So we're, we're only going to need two uh, anodes going to the last digit, but um, we, we do need to put them onto a separate digit because we've already assigned all of the segments that could go with this digit here. And then on this side, we are wiring to uh, the segment side again, and we're going to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and uh, H is the decimal point, sorry. And then we go uh, again, and we use the same segments as we did for this one here. But of course, here we're looking at the next digit along. And what we've got now is we've got a unique... A combination of segment and digit that we can use to address each of the segments on this display here and each of the segments on the display here and when we look at the code in a moment um, what I'll do is I'll show you how the MAX7219 is very rapidly um, enabling or disabling each of those combinations of segments and digits in order to light up these uh, different segments here um, and that's how a sort of all kind of multiplexing LED displays work effectively your eyes have a persistence of vision that actually means that you can retain an LED for about 20 milliseconds or so after it's uh, gone off so so long as the 
the Max 7219 kind of very quickly uh, lights and cycles through all of these LEDs. If it does it faster than 20 milliseconds, if it takes less time than that, um, your eyes will perceive this um, persistence of vision that will let you think that um, these LEDs have actually been on all the time. But it hasn't been. It's been cycling through them very quickly, switching on and off these segments and digits in order to um, display the output that you want to create. And that's it. And here's the code that's running on the Arduino. So starting at the top, and I'm including three libraries here. So a library is an external piece of code that provides some sort of functionality that you can include inside your own project. And the three libraries I'm including here can all be downloaded from within the Arduino IDE. So you go sketch, include library, manage libraries, and then from the library manager here you can search for these three names here. So I'm using the bounce to library. That's going to help debounce the button inputs. So that means that I'll make sure that I don't accidentally detect a double press or something like that when a player presses a button. For a sequence following puzzle, it's obviously very important to make sure that you don't accidentally pick up um, incorrect inputs by someone pressing the same button twice or something. Uh, so I'm using that library there. The fast LED library, I've used that lots of times before, normally to control NeoPixel strips, but here I'm going to be using it to control uh, my PL9823 LEDs instead. So those are the LEDs that are inside the buttons that change colour. And then I'm also going to be using the LED control library. That's what's going to control the MAX7219 chip to display the uh, stage indicator and also the numeric prompt on the seven segment display. Okay, then we get on to the constants. So constants are variables that are not going to change throughout the duration of the project. Um, so I define the number of inputs I'm using. Um, so I'm using four buttons in a row here, which I think is a, a good number to have. Any more than that, and you're gonna have to have problems searching for kind of distinct colors and things like that and the sequence gets too complicated for players to remember so I think four is fine. Um, I'm going to define the GPIO pins that those four buttons are wired into so based on the wiring diagram I showed you earlier I'm using GPIO pins four five six and seven. Uh, this is the number of stages that the player needs to progress through in order to solve the puzzle so um, I've actually only defined five in the code here, even though I'm using a bar graph that has 10 segments in it. Um, you can obviously change that to whatever value you want. Um, if you want to have a really high value of stages, you could change that bar graph display for a seven segment display again and, and have a numeric value of stages. Um, however you want, that's the whole point of defining it as a variable, is that something you can tweak and change yourself. The only thing to be aware of is that you will need to define the rules um, that players have to apply based on each of those stages. Um, so I'm actually applying a different rule in every stage. You can have the same rules in every stage if you want, but that kind of limits the, uh, the puzzle a little bit more. Then I've got my array of colors. So um, this is going to be equal to the number of inputs because the whole point is I want each input to correspond to a unique color. That's how players are going to recognize uh, what they're going to press. Um, and I'm using this CRGB structure here. That's defined as part of the fast LED library, which we included at the top here. Uh, so these are all um, predefined values. They're a little bit like um, HTML color codes, if you're familiar with that. Um, so these will just be a shorthand way of defining the different colors which I'm going to use. I've also created an array with just um, names for those colors. Um, that's not actually used in the game at all. That's only used for debugging later on, um, but it's useful to have something that you can uh, refer to just to make sure that the, the buttons are lit up the colors you expected them to be. Uh, now, the next two sections, these are arrays of the segments that we want to light up um, based on the stage and based on the prompt. So, as I was just showing a moment ago in the wiring diagram, we've got the segments of the 
LED bar graph are using two different digits from the Mac 7219. Um, so that's why we have an array with two elements here. This is going to be the first digit, as it were, and this is going to be the second digit. So when we're on the first stage, well, what we have here is a one in this position here corresponds to that LED being lit. A zero means it's not lit. So we're creating a, a binary value in which only the first LED is lit, and then the first two LEDs is lit, then the three, four, five. And then at this point here, we filled up all of the segments on the first digit. So when we go on to the next one, we have them all filled up, and we also fill in the first digit of the second, uh, the first segment of the second digit, sorry. And then we fill in the first two segments of the second digit. Now at this point here, we've run out, we haven't actually wired these ones up because remember we've got a, a 10 segment display. So that corresponds to eight segments in the first digit and two segments on the second digit here. But in theory, like I say, you can actually increase this if you used a different sort of LED indicator, uh, however you want. Um, the, the B at the beginning, by the way, this is a way of representing binary values in uh, code. So you might have seen, um, in other examples, you might have seen 0x used at the beginning, and then that would be a hexadecimal value following. Um, but if you write 0b, that means this is a binary value where 1 corresponds to uh, a bit that is on, and 0 is off. So here's the bar graph, and then we've got another array underneath it, and this corresponds to the segments we want to light up on the seven segment display. So for this, we want to give a numeric prompt. And again, I'm actually only using the values between one and four in the code later on. But if you wanted to make this more complicated, you could have uh, rules corresponding to all sorts of numbers. So I've included all, all digits in this array here. And just as with the bar graph, a one corresponds to meaning that segment is turned on, and a zero means it's turned off. And the, the little kind of ASCII art diagram here, this is to show how the segments are laid out on the LED display. So to light up the number three, for example, what we want is we want the A LED to be turned on and the B and the G and the C and the D, but not E or F. So that corresponds to this binary value here because we have the A the B, the C, the D, not the E or the F, but we do have the G in the middle, that's this one here, and then we don't light up the decimal point in any of them, so there's always a zero at the end. Um, and you'll see, so for example, the, the zero at the top here, well this lights up every segment except for the G and the decimal point, which would give you the outline of a zero. Um, so that's what this uh, value here, I'll show you how we actually send those values to the chip uh, in a function later on, but that's what they're that's what they're here for. Then we go on to the globals. Uh, so the globals are variables which are, are shared between all the functions of the project. Um, so we define a, a variable for our LED control, and as part of the constructor here, we need to give it some information. So we say the pins that we're using, and again, based on the wiring diagram which I showed earlier, we're using the uh, mozzie pin, which is 11. We've got the clock pin on 13. The load pin is 10. And we are only using a single MAX7219 chip. Um, it is possible to daisy chain lots together. If you've got a really complex project with you know hundreds of LEDs, uh, you can actually chain them together, but we're only using a single one here, so that's what that one value at the end is. We'll also keep track of uh, what stage the player is up to at the moment, so we'll have a current stage variable, we'll initialize that with a zero. Uh, we'll create an array of buttons, and as I mentioned, we're using the bounce to button library, so these are going to be um, an object which is called button here, and so we've got an array of four button objects here, that's going to correspond to our different inputs. We also have an array of four of the different LED values which are in each of those buttons. And then what we've got here is we've actually got 
um, three arrays that correspond to effectively the sequence that the current game is going to use. We actually calculate these in advance. So rather than every time the player progresses to the next stage, we calculate on the on the fly what happens next. What we're actually going to do is pre-calculate in advance when the game starts. All of the variations of answer options that will be selected, we'll shuffle them. We will select a random prompt for each stage and we'll work out what the correct input that the player needs to press at each stage is. We'll work that all out at the beginning, every time the game commences, and we'll store them in these arrays here. So this uh, array here, this will keep the uh, numeric prompt that the player is going to be given. And we need to have one element of, for that array for every stage of the game. This one here will be the uh, the answer option, so the colours, the order in which the colours will be presented to the players, and that's going to be a multi-dimensional array because we need to have um, each of the inputs in each of the stages. So uh, we've got two two different uh, array parameters there, and then we also need to know the index of what the correct button that the player needs to press was. That's going to be calculated based on the rules that we'll get to in a moment. And we need to know the correct button to press at each of the stages. So again, that's an array with number of stages. Um, then we go on to the setup. So setup function runs when the code first starts and every time the uh, Arduino is reset as well. And um, I mentioned this earlier. So the, the first thing we're going to do is to set a random seed. Because what we're going to do is we're going to shuffle the answer choices each time the game is played and we're also going to set random prompts in each stage and to ensure that they really are random we need to set a seed for the random number generator. Um, if you've not used random numbers in the past this uh, kind of might take you by surprise but normally on an Arduino unless you set a seed first when you call the random function what you'll actually do is you'll get the same sequence of values in the same order every time. And you kind of think, well, that's not hugely random. Um, so a random number generator actually sort of follows a sequence, a, a, a defined sequence based on a starting value. And it's the seed that we need to set to make sure that starting value differs every time we play. And one common method to set that seed to be different every time is to take a reading from an unconnected analog pin. So we've got nothing plugged into analog pin 5 on the Arduino, but we're going to try and take a reading from that pin anyway. And when we do that, what we'll have is we'll have a reading based on kind of background uh, electromagnetic uh, sort of radiation in the uh, environment around the Arduino. And if we assume that that is somewhat unpredictable, then that will give us a, a good enough value for our random seed to make sure it's different every time. You know, this is not completely scientifically robust, but for the purposes of an escape room game, that's a perfectly good way of doing it. So um, we're taking a reading from a pin that doesn't have any sensor connected to it here. Okay, and we'll set that as the random seed value. We'll start a serial connection, and as I've done in all my recent projects, we'll output some information just to say what code is running and when it was last compiled as well. Um, I'll tell you now, this code, the code itself is not that complicated, but because the nature of the game is to try to make the rules deliberately complex to follow, the serial output is really, really useful to make sure that you understand um, you know, what button is meant to be pressed at every stage and what button actually was pressed and things like that because you've got the colours changing positions and you've got perhaps the rules changing at every stage as well. So the serial output, although it's not used by players in the final version of the game, uh, it's really useful for debugging. Um, so you'll want to keep your Arduino plugged into your USB connection while you're testing this one. We'll initialise the uh, buttons and whereas normally you might initialize the button by just calling uh, pin mode and then supply the name of the input pin and set it to input pull up, something like that. Here we're using this buttons.attach function. Uh, so that was part of the button, uh, the bounce library that we included here. And what that's going to do is going to initialize 
the pin and it's also going to attach this button object to it at the same time. So from then on, rather than reading the input pin directly, what we'll do is we'll update the button object that's attached to that pin and that will apply a little bit of extra logic to, to take care of this debouncing issue to make sure that we don't get two repeat presses in a very short space of time and things like that. Um, we'll initialize the fast LED library. So this is what's going to handle our color changing LEDs under the buttons. Um, we'll say what sort of chip we're using. So we're using PL9823 this time. And this is the GPIO pin on the Arduino that is connected to the first LED in the series. Um, unlike WS2812B chips, the byte ordering for a PR9823 is RGB. Um, so most of the WS2812 chips I've seen, at least anyway, are normally green, red, blue ordering. But this is red, green, blue. And particularly for a colour sequence puzzle, that really matters that you get that right. Um, we'll tell it the, uh, the array of LEDs that's going to actually store the values that we want the LEDs to show. And we have got four LEDs in that array. So that's what those values there do. Um, these functions here, this is going to initialize the uh, MAX7219 chip. So uh, calling the shutdown function, which you might think is a strange way to initialize something. Uh, it's a little bit like turning Windows off by going to the start menu, I guess. Um, what we're doing here is we're waking the MAX7219 chip up by calling the shutdown function, but we're passing the value zero. So that basically means don't shut down, do the opposite, wake up instead. Uh, we'll set the intensity that we want the LEDs to light up from. Eight is middle of the range because it ranges from zero to 15. And we will just clear the segments just to make sure that there was no values left over from last time it was turned on. And then what we'll do at the end of setup, we will call the prepare function. And the prepare function is the thing that's actually going to uh, randomize, shuffle the answers, work out the correct sequence for the game that's about to be played. But before we get onto that, we've got a little function here that's going to help us. So uh, remember I said that you know there's lots of variations of rules that you can apply to this game. You can uh, you know press the number, press the button that's in this position, or press the button that has this color, or press the button that was this color in this stage, and things like that. And um, this is one of the helper functions that's just going to help us work out what the correct button to press is at each point. What this is going to do is to cycle through the uh, inputs and it is going to find the input whose color matches the color that we are looking for. So um, that array of color values that we had at the top here um, which we defined in the constant section. So we said red, blue, green, yellow. So let's say I wanted to find the button that in the current stage was colored red. Well, that's the first element in the colors array. And what this function here would let us do is it would let us look through the set of choices. And if I said the, uh, the value zero here, that would be the first element of the array. It would tell me which one of the inputs was the one that was colored red, for example. Um, so we're, we're going to make use of that function when we get onto the um, prepare function, which is what's coming next. So here it is. Uh, and this is really where the meat of the uh, logic of the game is written in this function here, okay? And you can make this as simple or as complicated as you want. The, the sections of code that I've written here, um, this is actually based on the logic of um, I think it's the memory game in Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, which is a game I've mentioned a few times recently. But this is really just intended as uh, examples that you can base your own logic on. So I do encourage you to sort of change these as you fit. So what we're going to do, we are going to loop over every stage in the game, because like I say, we're going to prepare the whole game in advance. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to work out a random number to display to the player at this stage. So the random function here, this is inclusive of the lower end and exclusive of the top end. 
So this is going to display the number one, two, three, or four. So it's not going to display it, it's going to assign it to uh, the prompt for the stage. Okay, then we are going to shuffle the inputs. Now, um, this function here, I have to confess, I did not write this algorithm here. This algorithm is something called the Fisher Yates Shuffle. And it's a very clever algorithm because what it lets you do is it lets you populate an array um, with a randomized set of values that doesn't repeat as you go along. So let's say you've got the numbers one, two, three, four. What this will do is this will let you uh, put them into an array only using at each stage unused numbers that you haven't chosen before. And this is a really kind of neat way of doing it. There's a, a, an explanation of how it works which I've included in the link here or you can just search for Fisher Yates Shuffle. But what it means what we're doing is that we are so we've prepared the prompt that's going to be displayed at each stage here. Now what we're going to do is shuffle the buttons and they are going to end up in the answer options array for this stage and we're going to end up with each of those values being somewhere between the numbers uh, you know one two three four will give us the button order for this stage um, so like I say don't you don't need to worry too much about exactly how this works if you'd like to look it up like I say you can look it up here but it's it's kind of a neat algorithm that uh, that shuffles the inputs around and you can use that you know in lots of different game scenarios as well so we've got our answer options we've shuffled the the, the buttons and we've also given a random prompt the next stage of the code here, what this effectively doing is stepping through the rules in exactly the same way that the player would have to. So what I've got written out in code here is the same as what the players would need to be presented with somehow. It could be inscribed on a tablet on a wall, it could be in a code sheet that they find in the room, it could be on a monitor, whatever they need to be given this exact same set of rules but kind of laid out in a, a way that's readable in the context of your game for example and like i say they they demonstrate a, a range of different possible rules that the player might need to apply so i'll just show you what they are um so first of all we this is a, a big switch statement so um the rules differ depending on which stage the player is currently in if they are just starting a new game, well that's this section here. If they're in the first stage and the prompt they're given is 1, the correct button they need to press is, well it's actually the second button along. It says 1 here but this is a, a 0 indexed array. So 0 would be the button on the left, 1 would be the button that's 1 in, 2 would be the button that's 2 in and 3 would be the rightmost button. So if they're shown the value 1, they press the button that is 1 in from the left. If they're shown the number 2, they also need to press the button that is 1 in from the left. If they're shown the button, if they're shown 3, they press the one that is 3rd in. And if they're shown 4, they're shown the one on the right hand side. Okay, so that's quite straightforward. The very first stage, and I'd encourage you to make sure that your first stage is simple as well. It will help give players some kind of enthusiasm and, and motivation to actually complete the puzzle rather than just getting frustrated at the very first step. So then they go on to the next stage and here we get the rules to be a little bit more complicated because what we're doing in this one here is if they are presented with the number one they have to press the button that has the fourth colour. Now to do that we are using this get index position of answer with value helper function, which I mentioned uh, just up here. Remember, I said that this will tell them the index of a uh, the button that has a particular color. So we're going to provide that function with the answer options that the player has in front of them. We're going to say that that we want the uh, the fourth colour, again this is a zero based index remember, so the number three here means actually the fourth colour in the array and that's the button that they have to press. Or if they're given the number two, well here we'll just say they press the same position as they pressed last stage. Now this is one of the reasons why we are calculating this array up front for the whole game when the game first starts because we've already worked that out here. We actually um, put that value in when we were in 
case zero, in stage zero, we assigned all these different numbers to the outer press. So now we can refer to that again in later stages. So this says uh, press the same position as pressed in the first stage. Um, you know, if you change this number here, we could make that any previous stage that had already been played. And in fact, we do that right at the end here. Um, we can say press the same colour as pressed in the first stage. We can say press the same position as pressed in the second stage by putting a 1 there, or the same position as pressed in the third stage by putting a 2 there. So there's really, um, you know, and you can make these really as, as complicated or as simple as you want them to be. Um, here we've got a, a mixture, so we've just got press the third button along, so you've got an absolute value. You can put a value that has previously been entered in one of the other stages. You can use this function to say the button that has a particular colour. Um, or you could say the button that had this colour in a previous stage, let's say. Or this colour, you know, this one here, is this is the same colour as you pressed in the first stage. So um, this is really just meant to be uh, examples. You can add new cases here for the number of stages that you have in the game. Uh, so if you want to have the game have 10 stages, for example, what you need to do is just duplicate this case and write the number of the stage that the player is up to. You don't have to have different rules at every uh, stage if you want. You can actually have the same rules throughout the game, but I think that will probably make it uh, a little bit too simple. Um, so yes, you can you can use these uh, rules exactly as I've written here if you want, or you know try not to start with them. Then I encourage you to sort of come up with your own and, and make it uh, fun by by fiddling around a bit. And then, as I mentioned, because this is relatively complex, um, you'll find that you'll really want to know what the correct answer is, especially in testing, and that's what this section here is for. So. Um, this is actually going to output to the serial monitor all of the um, the values that have been calculated by all of this randomness, all of these rules above. So what the shuffled answers were, what the uh, prompt the players are going to be given, and the button that they're meant to press. This is going to output them to the serial monitor in a nice, neat kind of table, um, just so you can step it through. Um, the next function. Now, this is I've included this in the code, although I don't actually uh, call it anywhere here, but I thought it was kind of helpful to include, so I've left it in there. This is effectively a, a hint or a help uh, function, which will stay at any point in the game. It will just send a little update to say the stage that you're currently on, the prompt that you're currently on, and both the index position and the colour of the button that you need to press to advance to the next stage. So this is really just a, a subset of what we were showing above here anyway, but rather than showing it for every stage of the game at the point they're calculated, uh, this one here will only be shown for the very next uh, input that needs to be pressed based on the current stage and the current uh, prompt. So it's effectively, it is like a, a hint function, and if you wanted to, you could um, you know, activate this function somewhere from a help button in the game, display it on a monitor or something like that. Um, I don't actually call it anywhere in the code here, but I thought I'd leave that in because you might find that uh, helpful. Phew, right, okay, so that was all uh, the preparation and the setup, um, which is, like I say, actually the most complicated part of this code. The main game loop itself is actually pretty straightforward because we've done all that work in advance. So what we do on every iteration through the game loop, uh, the first thing we do is we make sure that the correct prompt is being displayed on the seven segment display. So to do that, we'll call the set row function on the LED control object. The first parameter here, uh, this is the bank of uh, max 7219s we're using. Like I say, we're only using one in this case, so this is always going to be zero in all of these calls here. The next one here is the digit that we are going to display this value on. And the uh, LED display here, this is going to be the, it had its common cathode connected to digit zero on the max 7209. 
And then what value do we want to display? Well, that was defined right back at the top of the code here. We want to display the byte value that corresponds to the digit um, of the prompt that we want to tell the player. So that's what this value here does. We'll take the current stage, we'll look up the uh, prompt for that stage, and then we'll convert that into a binary value based on that array, and we will display it on digit zero. The next two uh, rows here, so um, this does the same thing, but this time we're going to be displaying the stage on the bar graph display. And remember that that was wired to digits one and two. Um, so we will get the correct array value for the left hand side of the display as it were and the right hand side of the display. So this is the first eight segments and the last two segments here and we'll display them on the first and second digits. Uh, the next thing we'll do is we'll update the colours on the LEDs behind the buttons. So all of this is here, this is all to do with lighting, just to make sure that we are setting the right combination of lights for the current uh, stage of the puzzle. And then once we've done that, well now we need to actually process the player input. So we loop over all the buttons and we call the update function here. So update is what we're going to use instead of directly reading uh, a digital read from the button pin. We're going to call the update function from the bounce library. And then we're going to ask the bounce library, has this button been pressed, newly pressed this frame? Um, so it wasn't pressed before, it's just been pressed. In that case, we'll output a little bit of debug information to the screen. And then we need to compare the button that has just been pressed, which is this one here, to the correct button that the player needed to press based on the stage of the game that they're currently at. So if they press the correct button for this stage, then what we can do is we can advance to the next stage. So we increase the current stage global variable here. And if after doing that, we find that we've actually got to the end of the game, because the current stage is equal to the total number of stages, this here is where you could add any code you want when the game is complete. So I'm just displaying a simple success message to the serial monitor here. But if you had, for example, a relay connected, um, and this is something I've done in a, a lot of previous games. So let's say you had a relay connected on pin, I don't know, A4 or something like that. And let's say that was an active uh, low relay so you could uh, have a function like that here this would um, energize a relay that could release a mag lock or it could activate any other load or something like that so whatever you'd like to do when the puzzle is completed you can add that in section here otherwise this else here corresponds to the if here so this whole section of code here is what gets executed if the correct input was made this means that the player has just pressed a button but it wasn't the right one for the stage they're in at the moment. So what we do then is we display a different message instead that says that wasn't right. We'll reset the stage counter back to the beginning and what we'll also do is we will reshuffle the game sequence again. Now if you just wanted players to play through the same game again um, so, you know, they're stage zero and they're stage one and however far they got, they could repeat the same actions they did last time. You could simply comment that out and the game would be uh, the same each time it was loaded up. Uh, but I think it's more fun to have, you know, a, a brand new start and start with a, a new set of prompts and, and colours as well. So I've, I've kept that in. And then finally, so this section here, this is all the end of the input section. What we need to do is actually call the show function to update the uh, LEDs that's under the buttons. Uh, because what we do at the um, top is we sent the LED values into the array, if I can find it here. So this is where we updated the LEDs array with the correct answer colors for each button. But what we then need to do is actually call the show function. This is going to push that data out to that series of four LEDs under the button in turn. And that will update. And there we go.
So that brings me to the end of this tutorial for my uh, colour sequence input puzzle. I hope you found it uh, interesting or useful or it gave you some ideas of games that you could create in your own escape room. Um, I really like this puzzle. I think there's lots and lots of elements about it which I like. I like the fact that it's randomised each time you play it. I like the fact that it has dynamic inputs. Um, the first time that players actually press one of these buttons and see that the colour sequence changes is always quite um, surprising and they really like that. I like the fact that it can involve more than one player and requires a range of different kind of uh, skills to solve as well. You know, you've got the observation of the colour sequence, you've got relaying that information, following the rules and applying them, and then uh, coordinating, communicating that information back to the person that enters the, the inputs as well. Like I say, the only shortcoming of it really is that it is not accessible to colourblind players. Now, if you've got an idea as to how I could incorporate that, I would love to hear it. I did think about um, placing small LCD displays inside each of these buttons. I did actually try doing that, um, but I found that it kind of got in the way of the button mechanism itself. It just wasn't really practical to do that, but I might revisit it in the future at some point. As always, I will upload the code and the wiring diagrams and the list of parts and things I'm using over on my Patreon account. Um, I'm only able to make these videos with the support of my amazing patrons and if you would like to check out the resources for this tutorial or any of the other escape room tutorials I do on this channel, do please um, head over there and take a look. Um, if you're able to support me as well, that would be amazing. Um, but if you are not able to, don't worry about it. I will carry on putting these videos on YouTube anyway. Um, in the meantime, if you've got any questions or comments about it, like I say, if you've got some improvements as to how to make it more accessible, I'd love to hear them. Um, but otherwise, I will just say thank you very much for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, cheers, bye.